Hi, this is probably one for Joe. So you talked uh, about how there are things you can do to improve your happiness. If you read any of the self-help literature, there's a sense that happiness is also a cognitive choice. You can choose happiness. Um, and none of the panel have mentioned that so far. To what extent do you think that might be true? I think the evidence for it is, is shaky, but there is certainly um, some great evidence that if people feel grateful for life, you know, like no matter where they are in the ladder of income or the ladder of social status or whatever else, if people in general feel grateful for like what they have and, and appreciate what they have, then those people seem to be much happier. So that's a case where you could have two people, one who was really rich, had a great life, one who was much poorer, who had seemingly a much worse life objectively, the person who appreciated the things that they had would likely be happier. So it's certainly not the case that just our environment or just these objective things around us determine our happiness. It's certainly how we interpret them. But I'm not really sure right now, based on the evidence, if we can choose to interpret them differently. Maybe that's just something fundamental about who we are um, and can't be trained. But I imagine that you can be trained a bit, but, but pr probably not to transform someone from being miserable to being joyful all the time. Anybody want to comment on that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I think, uh, so there's something about our behavior. We can choose our behavior, so it's a choice in that sense, that you can choose the things that you know that might make you happy, maybe based on scientific evidence, but it's what you expose yourself to. There are some things that will just make you, your body happy, and like this, you can influence your mind. You heard that thing about... Tickets for dance performances. <laughs> <don't we? laughs> so I think it's a really good question. The thermostat that sets our general level of both pleasure and also well-being must be set somewhere. Clearly there are genetic influences, but it's becoming more and more clear that the epigenetic influences are extremely important. And the first 18 months of life turns out to be absolutely key. And the kind of interactions that we have with our caregivers, whether they are mothers and fathers, we know that Again, taking it from the dark side, but if parents are postnatally depressed, which happens to about 10 to 15 percent of both men and women in this country, in other places in low and middle income countries like Malawi, it's about 30 to 40 percent of young mothers that suffer from postnatal depression. We know that if, if nothing is done, then 20 years later, those kids are much more likely to be depressed and anxious. We know that the thermostat somehow is being set much, much lower. So what it also means is, and, and the economist uh, Hickman has shown very clearly that the earlier intervention, the bigger bang for buck will you get. So if you were to make interventions at that early stage, um, and a good friend of mine, Alan Stein, has devoted his life to try to see where they can come up with ways, not necessarily using the brain, but just using simple interventions like having a video camera on the mother and a video camera on the baby, as they interact, say, around a mealtime, and the baby sort of is looking away, is not avoiding the mother, because, of course, there's not that kind of choreography, that kind of dance, that kind of naturalness to it. Now, if you then afterwards show the video to the mother and say, look, your baby smiled, the mother goes, no, no, my baby never smiles. You know, he just is feed, feed him. But, of course, you now have a video recording. You can show the baby smiling for whatever reason, but he's still smiling. And suddenly, when you open that door, the mother goes, that's right, he's smiling. Then you open up a way in which you can interact. And it's been shown that if you do this very simple intervention, which almost anybody can be trained to deliver, in places like South Africa, in Kailitsa, which is one of these sort of town, um, very just outside of Cape Town, it's been shown in a, in a randomized control trial, published in the BMJ, that this makes a huge difference. So I think we have a moral imperative to really make early interventions to set that thermostat high. But of course, the longer we wait, the harder it becomes to make the kind of choices and actually have the, the capacity to do so. Christine, thank you. Uh, what do we have a second question? Hello, I wanted to ask a bit about um, how you carry out your research. So for example, you said you have a lot of scans. Um, how readily available are these? So if, say, I wanted to look at the data and try to analyze it and maybe use to build some computer models out of interest, if I'm working on a single field, um, is the data readily available? And if so, where can it be accessed? And secondly, how easy is it to you know, carry out uh, an experiment where you kind of need an MRI scanner? Mm -hmm. 
or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> like if, if, if I had so many of songs I would like to try, how, how, <laughs> how might I go about that? Yes. <laughs> It's a bit like in Meaning of Life, isn't it? And when <laughs> she's about to give birth and they, they see that the hospital guys are coming in, so they roll in all of the expensive equipment and says, ah, I see you got the machine that goes pling. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is what MRI machines do. They go pling very loudly and cost a lot of money because they use helium. Um, so there's lots of data now available. I think we're coming to a stage where we are now making it publicly available, the human brain connection project, both the American and the European and the Japanese and the Chinese, are now making huge amount of data available. And that you can easily access, and then afterwards I can show you how to get access to that. So that you can certainly start modeling. You can look at how the cabling is going on, you can look at how traffic is running, and you can even have special populations, whether they are depressed or whether they're normal and so on. So the data is there. The big question, of course, is how do you ask the interesting questions about how, what it is that you want to find out? Because, as Vince also rightly pointed out, maybe we don't necessarily need scanners. I think I just gave you some evidence that, in fact, without scanners, we can still make people's lives better. The reason why I would argue that we still need scanners is not just because they are, make you know, nice noises and they look fine and give you blobs and so on. Because I think really what we would like to understand are mechanisms. I really think we would like to understand how it is that these things become unbalanced, like in a choreography and a dance, and how do, is it that we can then reshape that? And only by actually looking at the knots and bolts of this can we do that. Very selfish of you. <laughs> Next question. Um, this is primarily a question for Morton. Um, you mentioned um, in that a lot of the research you did was in terms of the response of the brain of either rats or human beings to hedonistic experiences, so like having an orgasm or uh, taking drugs or you know whatever. Um, did those uh, did those responses? To your knowledge, those responses vary between um, test subjects that had high levels, high reported levels of eudaimonic happiness, as your colleague was talking about, or was the hedonistic mechanical response the same across people with high and low recorded responses of eudaimonic pleasure over their lives? So this, of course, is a, is a very interesting question. Is it so that if you have a lot of pleasure, you also have a lot of well-being? Could it be that we are disposed, and if the thermostat for one is, the other one will go up? I think of pleasure as moments in a much larger state, which is perhaps something called happiness, although I'm not sure I understand what happiness is. I think it's a, it's a state of perhaps of contentment where there is very little wanting and perhaps very little liking as well. Um, I think the, the, to answer your question directly, nobody has ever really looked at this in any great detail. And part of the big problem, of course, is the questionnaire question. You, know, you ask people, you have to take, of course, what they say as valid. But as Vince also mentioned about the Danes, I mean, I think there's a certain amount of self-deceit going on here. Um, and now, of course, the Norwegians are even more so, right? But, um, um, in fact, I think, personally, having you know, been away for many years, but going back regularly, I think one of the things that makes us at least say that we are so happy is because we all know that we have a common friend. I just met Julie tonight, but I'm sure very, <laughs> if we spoke for about two minutes, we'll discover that we haven't become a friend. So when she asked me how happy I am tonight, I was like, ecstatic. Absolutely. <laughs> but in fact, of course, I am. <laughs> <laughs> question. Oh, we've got, we've got a whole crew of questioners up there. The professional question crew. <laughs> we have the next four questions from this corner. Uh, very interesting. Um, thank you. Um, what, a couple of points in your, <coughs> your comments, obviously. I mean, isn't, in essence, it like light and dark, that overall you're going to get both things roughly in equal measures across the whole of the population? Uh, so a comment on that. A, a second one is dance, obviously, is a, 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 um, gives you exercise, endorphins, and kephalins, which give you pleasure. But also, it's like <clears throat> birds of paradise. You know, if you, a bird of paradise is dancing, obviously, it's enjoying itself, looking for something. And the other one, looking at it dancing, is uh, looking at that measure of physical fitness, etc., etc. So that on many levels, uh, dance serves, um, uh, serves animals, as well as obviously humans are an animal. And the final one was about, in, in society, um, you're talking about the rich, better off, poor, but also in the more equal societies, I think 
work by Wilkinson and Pickett and others have shown, that overall a more equal society is happier. Even the rich who are less the distance in terms of how people judge themselves, which is in relation to other people, rather, to, rather than to the total amounts. Can we, can we take the last one first, because we remember that. Joe, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I, th I think, I th I think the, the, the truth is, is that it, people don't mind inequality. What they mind is unfairness, isn't it? Uh, so do you want to comment on, uh, on, on equality in society and, and happiness? Yeah, I mean, I think that at a basic level, even if we were just to take kind of a purely uh, economic look at this, you know, each person has like a number of happiness attached to them, some utility metric, you know, I'm, I'm 80, someone else is 90, whatever, then inequality would kind of automatically make the aggregate amount of happiness less. Because if, every, if more people felt less rich because there was more people above them, and obviously the more unequal it is, the more people will feel that there are all these rich people who they're much lower than in the scale, then that's going to create less happiness. Um, on, on the evidence that uh, rich people are happier in more equal societies as well, I, I think that's more controversial. I, 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 I don't actually think that's um, true. I think that basically, on, on aggregate, we, societies would be happier if they were more equal, but I think that the rich would be happy like either way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Juliet, um, uh, on dance? Does dance do the, is dancing in animals the same as dancing in humans? No, so... <laughs> <laughs> we can move on. No, go ahead. More? If we are, please, yeah, I'd like to know. Uh... So uh, we did a bit of an analysis to look into the different types of dance that there are in other species, and uh, it seems more like uh, something like an adaptation than a homology. So it's... it's when you look at different species that are phylogenetically alienated from, from the human lineage, and, but you have behaviors at the other end which are the same, you can ask whether it comes from the same basis or not, and it seems not to be related. Uh, in the animals, it's more about stereotyped rituals, whether in humans it's not all about sex, it's about other things as well. So, for example, can I take it a bit further? Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, so you said light and darkness. And, uh, of course, in life we need both, basically also to see the difference between the two. And in the arts, this is reflected very nicely, because we don't have only happy art. We actually also have sad art. We have very, very sad ballets, and we are deriving great pleasure from them. And there are some biological reasons for that. And that's why I think that what you were kind of implying is that we need both. And for example, for me, in the arts, or in dance in particular, um, is a way to achieve both in a safe space. Not in real life, but in a safe space where we can experience what we need for our bodily health. And that has a repercussion into our mental health. Another question from up there? Um, it's often said that uh, scientists are happier than artists. Um, we get paid that's more. True, and if so, why? <laughs> but Vince has uh, is it often that. said? I've <laughs> never heard it. Has anybody ever heard that said before? I, I've, I've never heard that said before. You made that up, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> you? You believe that scientists are happier than than, than artists? Have you never heard that before? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Um, they take because more drugs the than us. They are uh, more defined, more um, satisfying, rather than the artist's work, which is you know more abstract and, yeah. and and so forth. Is there not some connection there? Um, I, I can't think of any. Joe, jo, go ahead. <laughs> Just to take a slightly different tack on this, I think that um, there is a lot of evidence that people who feel like their ambitions were not met are less happy, and. Even though I think that a successful artist has every opportunity to be as satisfied and happy as a successful scientist, I think the nature of art is that the rewards are much less evenly distributed. You know, you have like some celebrity artists, you have some people who can make a living, and then you have many people struggling. And to make a slightly more serious point, I think if you look at how we're educating people in society, if you look at the numbers of people going to art college, training to be dancers, whatever, and then you look at the number of people who it is available to them to make a life, to make a decent living from those things, those things are wildly mismatched. So I can totally believe that due to the high level of failure within arts, um, that 
people would be less satisfied overall as a group than the scientists, but I, I wouldn't necessarily think that two successful people in either field would feel unsatisfied. Does anybody have any data on this? Because I don't believe either of you. I basically don't accept that there's a difference between art and science as such. I think it's, I think it's important not to stereotype like that. And I think, if anything, having worked with artists, I think that's really what comes to the fore. And I think one of the things you, all, you experience is, is just different way of getting at the same kind of knowledge. One is perhaps a bit more quantifiable than the other. And having, the, having a, a, a sense of uh, 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 purpose, I think, when people do go to, to art college and they, they learn an instrument or they, they learn their art or they, or they learn dance, they have got a, a sense of purpose, something that they want to get better at for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And I think that can sow a, a, a real seed of, of happiness. But I, I agree with Morton as well that, that, that we, we sometimes polarise the differences between the arts and, and the sciences. Yeah. It is easier for us to make ordinary workaday lives, though. <laughs> yeah. Another question? Hello. Um, so I guess there's a question, two questions, quick questions. Is that Virginia? For... Yes, hi. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is relevant to the room. I'm uh, one of uh, Vin's ex-students. I'm the first one also who's introducing themselves. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Two quick questions for Joe, uh, but I think I would love to get the insights of, of all three of you. One of them is, I wonder where Bhutan and Costa Rica appeared on your map, because uh, on your graph, because uh, there's, from what I understand, a lot of research done on, on how happy these people are. And the second thing is, um, I think I'm really, really cautious on the methodology of um, asking people if they're happy or not. So all the research that you've shown is, about stated happiness, not revealed happiness. And now you're making me wonder if there's such a thing as specific things that could reveal that you're a less happy or more happy or happier person. You see what happens at UCL. <laughs> <laughs> sure, so just to deal with the, um, the second question first. So um, I agree, totally controversial about whether someone's saying that they feel satisfied with their life what does that mean? What does it mean to say that? You can totally imagine that some people would just feel greater social pressure to say this, you know, and that might affect results. I think that there is good evidence. I mean, I found very convincing my monkey example, but, um, but I think that there are, there are lots of evidence that basically yeah. these things are correlated with one another. You know, like that's that. even, I mean, you're even asking the zookeepers to state whether the monkeys <laughs> are like, that's perceiving it from their perceptions, not from the revealed. Uh, that's true. So, I mean, the way that you deal with revealed um, happiness is, is really that's the language of economists who would basically say that people reveal their preferences for certain things by seeking to maximize their welfare, by spending money in certain ways, or by you know, allocating resources that are scarce. But to me, that's a much less convincing way of finding out about human well-being. I mean, if you think about how the government looks at the world when it's deciding whether to build HS2, it it gets these giant projects where economists sit around and they um, try and work out what is the, the welfare enhancement or the welfare decline of like knocking through a town. You know? uh, and they do that by just basically equating all forms of happiness into just money. Now, we just, I think I, I suggested in my talk as well that I mean, money certainly isn't the only thing that matters for happiness. Yeah, it's the only thing we can measure in terms of revealed preferences. Um, so I feel like that both forms are incomplete. Um, I do think that these responses to these happiness surveys are correlated with meaningful phenomenon about um, antidepressant use and about how, how long people live for, you know, um, about all these different things. So I think everything we do to try and measure it will have measurement error. You will have a big bit of error in there too. And that if you can cross-validate by having lots of forms of measurement, that's way better. Um, but it's not always possible. Uh, uh, what are the? Uh, what I'm still unhappy about is is how we. <laughs> this could go anywhere. Uh, is the um, is the way we conceptualise happiness. So, what are the kind of big four or five things that we should be asking of people? And if, as Virginia says, uh, asking them is 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 a bit dodgy itself. How should we be observing happiness? What are the ways? What are our best ways of measuring happiness? What are the big? So, a sense of purpose is one. A sense, of, a sense of pleasure is another, a sense of, of safety perhaps is another, a sense of control is another, but um, we haven't got agreement on them within psychology and, and, and neurosciences, so we, we don't really know what to look at behaviourally, which leaves us completely unable to know what to look at 
in, in terms of the brain? Or, or, or do you think we've got further down that line than I'm suggesting? I mean, I think that just because we can't all agree perfectly on a single definition doesn't mean it's not worth pursuing. Yeah, yeah, oh, if you definitely. think about something yeah. like, you know, the development of measuring IQ, you know, I mean, that's something that's <clears throat> been controversial basically since it, like, <laughs> came out as an idea. And basically no one talks about IQ. They talk about all these different things that are correlated with each other that have these meaningful predictive qualities on outcomes. You know, so... And then we call this G. G is basically the thing that we agree is highly correlated that predicts performance, that predicts life outcomes mm. like employment and income and all these different things. So I think that even if we can't agree on happiness, let's come up with a new term and say there is something that is correlated highly with all these different areas, has these important predictive outcomes on things that we think are meaningful for life, and I think we can agree on that at least. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, hi, oh, yeah, I'm Danny Haven. Hi. We've got a whole group of students here. <laughs> um, I don't really know how to phrase this, but um, do you think that happiness could be innate, as in it's selective to some people? So some people, they just have more power to, to choose to control their levels of happiness, no matter like what social problems they've been through. Some people just seem to be able to have the willpower to be more happy uh, compared to, for example, I don't know, people with depression who, you know, they want to be happy, but some just don't have that willpower. So do you think that happiness could even be, like, selective to certain people? Morton, can I hand that to you? And yeah. so your tips, maybe your tips. Maybe I mean, I think, not. first of all, I think it's important to realize that willpower is not actually something we understand. Um, and also, I think the other thing to realize is that as I said earlier, I think the epigenetic factors, so the early life experiences, coupled, of course, with some genetics, but it's not at all clear that there is a genetic disposition for a particular temperament at this point. But what is very clear that those early formative months, especially the first 18 months, are absolutely crucial to how it is that we, the trajectory that we take in life. Now, the other thing I think is important to, to mention, and I completely agree with you. It's very difficult to define happiness. I have, you know, having studied pleasure for a long time, I, I chose to go for pleasure because I still don't know how to yeah. define yeah. happiness. But what I do know is that there are a lot of unhappy people out there. There are lots of people that suffer from mental disorders, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, and so on. And it's clear that they suffer from anhedonia. Mm. Um, and so my simple thinking is that if we can fix the anhedonia, if we can make sure that they can at least enjoy the things that are available to them, and notice, by the way, that the perhaps most important factor in whatever happiness is, is other people. It's basically having meaningful relationships with other people, which, of course, is exactly what we learn during the first formative 18 months. This is why parenting is, or caregiving is so important, and this is why orphanages should be abolished. There's no good reason to have orphanages something that gets me quite angry, but let's leave that aside. But I think the key thing here is to realize that there is a science here. We don't, as Joe, I think, says, we don't think we need to define happiness. I think we have to agree, though, that we want to at least try, it in a sort of Bentham kind of way, we are, after all, talking about the University College London. And Bentham, as you know, also was at Queen's College, where I'm from, although he hated every moment of it. So that's probably why he I, I was there. And I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a certain resemblance, right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> except you still have your head. Right? <laughs> the auto icon. For what use this is. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think the bottom line is that I think the key idea here is that we need to at least try to bring, if not more happiness to those who already have happiness, then at least bring everybody up to a state where they can seek their own happiness. And that, I think, is really for me at least, a take-home message. And I think we really have a moral obligation. And a lot of the things we do don't need big scanners, they don't need lots of equipment, they can be very simple things like dancing. Take something like Parkinson's disease. So in Parkinson's we have a full understanding of, or very clear understanding of how it is that people become Parkinsonian. It's basically the dopaminergic um, generators in the brain that break down in the substantia nigra, and after a while you start getting this kind of symptoms that you all have seen. Now, what you probably don't know is that even before you get any of the motor symptoms, you get people who, when they go to the GP, look like they're clinically depressed. Because the lack of dopamine, although dopamine is not about pleasure, it's really about motivation, means that their systems are no longer capable of actually producing states that are of well-being. And you can alleviate that with electrodes, at least with the motor symptoms, but the, the real kind of hard problem is how do you give them a sense of purpose back? Now, 
one of the really interesting things is that there's actually been a randomized control trial where they got them to dance. So they had sort of, uh, not the kind of it balls kind of dancing, but real kind of, well, maybe a bit like it balls, in fact. Um, and then they had them either do this for four weeks, or they had them on exercise bikes. And the way they measured how well it was, was basically to look at their motor symptoms. Not to ask them how they were feeling, but just look at the severity. And lo and behold, actually doing dancing for four weeks did make a big difference. Probably as much as the kind of dopamine replacement drugs that they were given. I, I, I like Martin's sense of the fact that, that we, we might have an imperative. One of the reasons for this discussion at all, as I said at the very beginning, was that we put so much effort into understanding uh, negative emotions and negative mental states that we tend to uh, put a lot of effort into undoing those instead of nurturing where we are when we're in those good states and trying to perpetuate those, those good states. Any more questions? One at the front here. It's a determined hand. Hi. Going back to the first 18 months of life, I want to bring up the idea of teaching every teenager, boy and girl at school, about the realities of parenthood and meeting the emotional needs of their future babies or children and themselves as parents, um, because I'm trying to push to have this in all schools, and I don't know if you think this would lead to an in enormous rise in f happiness for the future. I would hope so. I think the more we can, the more we can learn about this absolutely crucial process, I mean, it's kind of crazy, isn't it, that all of us in this room either have parents or will have had parents in the past, and yet we know next to nothing about what happens in our brains if we become parents. So I was shocked by this, and recently I got a grant to study this. So in Danish mothers and fathers, I find people that would like to have kids. I have a very entrepreneurial postdoc who helps them get kids. No, <laughs> I wait for them to get pregnant, and then I scan them again, and then I scan them after 18 months to understand what kind of process is actually involved, both in their behavior, because we measure them in all kinds of ways, including asking them how they feel, but also just measuring their ability to actually deal with both a baby, but also to look at how it is they react to baby cues, the way, as I showed in my presentation, how they look, how they sound, and most importantly, I think, with my two daughters, one of the things I got really hooked on was the smell from the fontanelle. And again, nobody's ever looked at that. Why is that so singularly meaningful to smell a baby? And again, the evidence, although we've only got cross-sectional evidence at the moment, we haven't finished the study yet, so if anybody is thinking about you know, a baby, come to me. Um, <laughs> no, no, wait, that, that came out wrong. <laughs> come to my postdoc. I have to ask, and if they're thinking about an orgasm? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the more relevant question is, how did Yannicko know whether these women had orgasms or not? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, sworn, I'm sworn to secrecy. Uh, after, I think last time I was here at the RI in 2011, I, 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 I actually told the audience, and then there were two women that came up to me afterwards and said, please don't tell our husbands. Please. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a surefire way that you can tell. Anyway, I think you're right. <laughs> like, nobody wants you to move on from me anyway. <laughs> Just nobody. <laughs> we have a question at the front here. <laughs> Fair kid. Um, do you see any correlation between kindness and happiness? both in terms of being a, a kind person or being the recipient of an act of <coughs> kindness. Because there has been some research done showing that um, if you, if you um, do random acts of kindness every day, uh, it will make you more content or more happy. And I just wonder if you've got any comments on that. Yeah. Does anybody know that any of the research on this? And if anybody's got a comment on this, if any of you know anything about it, you're welcome to, to chip in. Anybody? Yeah. I mean, so I think there's really good evidence about the fact that um, kindness seems to bring the person who was kind um, a lot of pleasure and happiness. So some work done by um, Michael Norton and Liz Dunn, for example, where um, in an experiment um, on a Harvard campus, they would just give people money and... And then in the experiment, half the people were told, please spend this money on yourself, buy yourself whatever you want, buy yourself something nice. Um, or they were told, please uh, 
use this money for someone else. So they could have given it to a homeless person, they could have bought a gift for a friend, they could have bought flowers for their parents, whatever else. And then they kind of came back to them the next day and asked them how happy they were. And basically, people who'd done the kind act were much happier than people who hadn't done. Um, there's also, kind of more generally, <clears throat> in personality psychology, uh, personality psychologists are interested in dividing people up into what type of person are you? How am I different from you? And so they have this thing called agreeableness, this trait that represents how warm and kind and nice you are to others. And people who are highly agreeable, people who tend to be nice and warm and kind to others, also tend to be happier as well. So I think that there is definitely a link between kindness and happiness. Thank you. We had a question down at the back. So I, I wonder if there's a problem when you're thinking about seeking happiness, mainly because we don't know what makes us happy. That's one reason. And the other reason is sometimes to ask yourself when you're ha if you're happy will take you out of that state. It's a little bit like being unself-conscious. It's fine until you wonder if you are, right? As, 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 in, as in the song, right? If you're happy right. and you know it, clap your hands. Clap your hands, right. <laughs> but but, but this, this kind of puts pressure on, on Joe's idea because, you know, he was wanting to say, relax. And part of that relax uh, uh, philosophy there is supposed to be don't ask them and don't ask yourself whether you're happy. I mean, Gilbert Ryle, the philosopher, said, happiness is not the sum of pleasures. He can be in his garden all afternoon, suffering back strain and muscle ache, but at the end of the day, he's happy. And equally, I think academics might know, it's pretty tough to write an article and to try and bring it home, but when you're doing it and when it's going well afterwards, you can feel happy. So maybe we don't know. So seeking might be the wrong thing, and certainly asking ourselves might be the wrong thing, which maybe makes the data kind of useless. <laughs> 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 what makes you happy, Barry? <laughs> Being at events like this. Listening to, listening to these wonderful speakers. Uh, does anybody want to uh, answer Barry's point? I think he, I think he answered it himself. He answered it himself. <laughs> Just one little point. I think that part of your question gets to this idea of flow, this idea that if we're lost in the moment, people seem to find that very pleasurable. And so there's lots of research in organizational behavior where it's like, what kinds of tasks at work make people happiest or most fulfilled? And basically, when you're, when you're lost in something, when you're, not, when you're able just to forget that anything was ever happening afterwards, that seems to be a really powerful way that people feel motivated at work and enjoy work. So uh, I don't have an answer to your bigger question, but the idea of flow is certainly important to pleasure and happiness. And, and Raoul's articulation that happiness isn't just the, the sum of pleasures. I think he's exactly what makes it a hard thing to, to study and pleasure an easier thing to study. Other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, yeah. As, as an old uh, medically qualified cynic, I've always looked on happiness as a pathological condition. <laughs> <laughs> did, did the panel recognise any difference between happiness and contentment? You yes. mentioned it a couple yeah. of times. But... I hope you weren't a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question you'll have to ask me later. <laughs> happiness and contentment. <laughs> well, I think, I think I've certainly already laid my cards on the table. I don't think it's possible, really, at this point in time, to really find out what happiness or contentment is. We have a feeling, but I think our intuitions may be wrong, as Barry rightly points out. I think... On the other hand, there does seem to be states that reliably will induce this, and people afterwards will say that they had a great time dancing, <coughs> even watching dancing. Taking drugs, certain drugs, like psilocybin, people, as you will know as a medical doctor, people that, that are terminally ill often have very severe anxieties that makes it very difficult for them to, to basically have a, have a good passing. Now, if you give them just a small dose of psilocybin, they go into this state where the anxiety lifts and they talk about these meaningful states that are as meaningful as having their first child or going to their first rave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why is that? Why is something as simple as that? Why would that bring this state about? So there clearly are states there. And of course, one of the things that you can do is you can try to triangulate these things. You can try to look at what is it that is really nice about grooves or psilocybin or just meaningful interactions with the baby or the smell of a baby. And I think you could get to a state where you could 
start to make some headway into finding out what is really this elusive thing that we find is so difficult to talk about. In fact, the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard talked about how it's really only something that happens afterwards. Right? It's only afterwards that we knew that we were truly happy. And as Steinbeck said, that really is the tragic miracle of consciousness, that we're constantly worrying about what have gone before and what will happen, and we forget this moment. So we don't really know about <laughs> happiness and contentment. Uh, there's one more hand, one, and the last question. Um, who's got the microphone? Okay, the second last question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is more about kind of asking for clarification. So you pointed out about progressive... Um, progression and having little things that are adding to your happiness over a period of time, such as money increasing. Um, and then you use the example of having a chronic illness and how that causes pain multiple times and you don't really adapt to that. I wondered if you could kind of clarify that for me because I suffer from diabetes and I was diagnosed back in August and since the diagnosis, I'm actually... I now am a lot, I find it a lot easier to cope with it. I do have bad days and it causes me pain and finger pricking and injecting is really hard, but I am adapting to it. So I wondered if you could clarify your point there. Sure. So uh, my point certainly wasn't that any ongoing illness would lead people to never adapt to it. Like my point is that there are some things we adapt to and there are some we don't. And there's lots of different pockets of research and we don't really know the rules yet about what things that we adapt to. I mean, it's just another example that might make things a bit clearer. So, um, for example, something like unemployment. People never adapt to being unemployed. Unemployment makes people miserable on an ongoing basis again and again and again. And in terms of health, there is evidence that if people have like one-off health events, then they adapt to those more quickly and easier than if they have an ongoing illness. But clearly, illnesses are going to affect people differently, um, and there's going to be different severities of illness and things like that. So I don't have answers to when will people adapt and when will people not in health. But I think my broader point is that there are some things that we find easy to adapt to, and there are some things we don't, and the evidence is still to come in about when and why and how those things happen. Thank you. Very last question, sorry. Hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to say to Joe that your socks have brought me a lot of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my question was... They match the seating. We did, they, none, of this happened, <laughs> none of this is accidental. Uh, <laughs> um, but my question relates to the fact that I used to work with um, babies and preschool children. And I jokingly used to refer to the fact that I wondered whether some were born with the happy gene. And um, Mark mentioned genetic influences. I wondered what research might have been done on literally being born with a, a disposition to happiness. So there has been some genetic studies, but the numbers that are involved are not, I think, sufficient to really warrant any more than a sort of a shaky foundation. That's not to say that if we have larger numbers, then we might be able to do it. But of course, you know what it's like with geneticists. They have solved all the problems. And even if they did solve all the problems, of course, the next question, take cystic fibrosis. We know all the genes, but where is the actual treatment for that then? So I think at the moment, I think the smart data is that it's really about how we interact with other people, maybe on a basis of genetics, of course. And I think all, nobody would deny that, of course, the way that the, your brain is built, especially when it's not built in a normal way, that would very strongly affect the way that you experience the world. Still, we all sort of also try to have templates. We look at babies and we say, you know, that's clearly a happy baby. And maybe just by saying that they're happy babies, they become happy babies. Oh, we finished on a mmm. I, I, I definitely, I would have finished an hour ago on an mmm. Um, can we, um, uh, first of all, thank you for, for coming and thank you for your, for, your, for your questions. Can we thank the three speakers, please? Uh, Morton, Julia, and Joe. Uh,